Not too close. What do you think? I got that insurance? What insurance is that, Yogi? The one you really need to have. If you don't have it, that's why you need it. Need what? I fly. Well, if you get hurt and miss work, it won't hurt to miss work. Uh-huh. And they give you cash, which is just as good as money. Hey, guys. Tonight we're going to nerd out on some baseball by talking about the legend Yogi Berra. But before we get started, remember, you can find us by searching nerdybones.podbean.com and looking under three in history. We are on Podcast Addict, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, Pandora, Stitcher, and anywhere else you can listen to your podcast. Also like us on Facebook at 3 in History Podcast and leave us a review as we greatly appreciate it. Thanks, guys. We'll get started now. If there was a better intro, I... I dare you to show me a better one. So let's. <laughs> so what are we talking about tonight, guys? I'm so excited. Like you were talking about, we're going to talk about baseball and Yogi Berra. Yep. Yeah, Yogi Berra, man. It's uh, it's the first one I've done. So I was. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We got to say that off the top. Like, uh, uh, thanks, guys. So far, like everything you've listened to with Three in History, I'm so excited. Jake is going to bring his episode, and then we're going to have Zalana bringing her episode soon. So yeah. let's rock and roll, son. So yeah, I was I was a little hesitant to do it because it's a sports guy on a Nerdy Bones channel, but you know. Well, I mean, that's the thing. That's what makes. You, that's why it's called Nerdy Bones. So it makes you nerdy in your bones. Fair enough. This is this is what makes Jacob nerdy. So <laughs> we're going to respect it and talk about it. Yes. So uh, the to, before I get started, the sources I used uh, I used a one book that Yogi wrote himself called Ten Rings: My Championship Seasons. Nice. Uh, I used uh, another book. Called Yogi by John Pessa, narrated by Oliver Wyman. It was the audio. Nice, dude. You got the audio books are the shit. The shit they're yeah. great. They're great for research. He honestly. did. He did. He did a really good job too. He does the voices and stuff. <coughs> well, the best thing about audio books is they, um, you tend to absorb a little bit of it more because they yeah. they come to you with like character voices and stuff. Sure, sure. All right, and then uh, I also listened to a, a podcast called Sports with Friends by Seth Everett uh, featuring Marty Appel. He was the Yankees historian and a former PR director. The show's called Sports with Friends? It's Yeah, Sports with hey, Friends. Shout out to them, guys. If you listen to us, give them a listen, and maybe we'll, maybe we'll tell, tell their fans they'll listen to us. Yeah. Yeah, here's open. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, Lawrence Peter Barra, or Lorenzo Petro Barra, I was born May 12th, 1925, in a primarily Italian neighborhood of St. Louis called The Hill. Uh, his father, Pietro, came to Ellis Island from Italy on October 18th, 1909. So this, this is Yogi's dad? This is Yogi's okay, dad. Okay, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, me. you're good, you're good. Uh, he worked as a laborer, and he saved up to send for his wife, Paulina, and Lawrence's two o- older brothers. They barely spoke any English. Uh, before he received his famous nickname, uh, young Lawrence went by Larry, or Laudy, by his parents. Loudy? L- Lottie, yeah. <laughs> Loudy <Lottie> Barra? <laughs> That's kind of a neat name, Loudy Barra. So he grew up on Elizabeth Avenue across the street from his lifelong friend Joe, Joe Garagiola Sr. and on the same block as Hall of Fame broadcaster Joe Buck. Damn, dude. And their street would actually be I, later named Hall of Fame Place. See, I'm, I was about to say I'm a layman and I know how important that was. Yeah, it's three people in baseball right <laughs> Yeah. Here. Uh, anyway, uh, Lottie and the neighborhood kids spent most of their days reading comic books and playing baseball, much to the dismay of their fathers. <laughs> uh, to them, baseball, this is a quote from Ten, Ten Rings, uh, to them, baseball was a waste. They expected your future was to find a regular trade, work hard, bring home that paycheck. Lottie's three old, older brothers were forbidden by Pietro to pursue baseball. The oldest brother, Tony, was the best ball player in the family. He was invited to try out for the Cleveland Indians, but his father refused to let him go because they needed to work to support the household. So here's my question. So when he was invited to the Cleveland Indians, was he already like playing for a league or like how did they find him? Well, they uh, just kind of play around the, the neighborhood. They would pick yeah, up. Yeah. There's like little leagues around town. That's pretty stuff, dope. You know? He yeah. was he was good enough for the Indians. Oh, he like. was really good back then. He, they said that he was uh, he was. One that like was an all-around player, uh, Yogi ended up being one that he was a good hitter, but he definitely early like I'll get into so it. So he was on, he was good all around. Yeah, Tony was really good all around. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, anyway, uh, Lottie dropped out after eighth grade to go to work. Uh, he had very little interest and missed missed a bunch of classes, which of well, course frustrated grade. his teachers. Yeah. He bounced around some places, working in a Coca-Cola truck, a coal yard, a shoe factory. 
Uh, one of the only jobs he really enjoyed was selling newspapers because one of his customers was Joe uh, Ducky Medwick. He's a player for the St. Louis Cardinals at the time. Uh, actually ended up being an MVP. Nice. What uh, was the year on that? This was uh, like the 30s. 30s? Like, yeah. Let's see. That's pretty cool when you think about like players back like that long ago and still influencing kids. That shows you how far back baseball really Oh, yeah, is. definitely. Uh, so uh, another quote is that, uh, Medwick used to hit pitches over his head or near his toes and hit to all fields. He didn't make hitting into some science, and I kind of used the same theory. If I could see it good, <laughs> I could hit it good. Besides the pitcher throws, I've got a bat, and what good does it do if I don't swing? <laughs> <laughs> I, he throws it good, I can hit it good. <laughs> exactly. He, he was all about it. He could hit it from wherever. He, if he could see it and he liked it, he was going to swing. Uh, Lottie was fine working in the morning, but by afternoon he was thinking about finding a game which upset his employers. Uh, his father was convinced that he was destined to fail. He was certainly none, to please, none too pleased when Lottie told him he was going to become a professional baseball player. Uh, fortunately, Paulina and his three uh, brothers convinced Pietro to let him have a chance. Uh, in fact, his brothers all actually promised to take on extra work to cover Lottie's ex expected portion. Uh, they, they, that's really, at the time, that's really dude, cool. Dude, yeah. Like, uh, and, and Lottie obviously promised to send any money he made from playing ba uh, baseball back to the family, too. Wow. Uh, Pietro said if Lottie couldn't get anywhere in baseball in a reasonable time, though, he'd have to give it up and find a real job. Fair enough. Uh, at 16, Lottie uh, joined the American Legion Ball and learned how to play, so to learn how to play. Uh, there were no dugouts or benches, so when he sat, it was arms folded and legs crossed. Just on the field? Uh, yeah, literally, exactly. Literally just sitting on the field? Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and so his teammates, uh, I heard uh, two different names. It said uh, Jack McGuire or Bobby Hoffman are the ones who gave him. They were recently watching a newsreel about India, and they said he looked like a yogi, uh, hence the nickname. And, uh, oh, yogi bear. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, according to uh, Yogi, it says it was Bobby Hoffman. Uh, Yogi says in Ten Rings that it was a couple of my teammates, Jack McGuire and Bobby Hoffman. So, basically, they both get credit. That's crazy to think the cartoon character Yogi Bear, at its core, has his name from an Indian Yogi. I bet you don't even think about <laughs> no, that. No, yeah, exactly. We get to that in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, in 1942, uh, the Cardinals held an open tryout, and Joe and Yogi, uh, his, you know, his friend Joe Garagiola, uh, they were determined to make the club. The, the Cardinals general manager, Branch Rickey, offered Joe a $500 signing bonus. Shit. At the time was about, in 2018, that's, uh, 2019 is about $7,800, <laughs> which is still, I mean, Dude. Uh, but it, and that would go into effect when he graduated high school. But uh, Rickey didn't, he felt Yogi was too awkward and that he'd never become a ball player, so he, he didn't offer him anything. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, a scout did eventually convince him to offer Yogi 250, but Yogi pretty much told him to fuck off. He wanted the same <laughs> as Joe. Hey, I don't blame it, man. Uh, so months later, uh, Yogi actually got a telegram from Ricky, the same GM. He was now with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he told him to report to spring training. But it came just a few days after he signed with the Yankees for the same $500 signing bonus as Joe. But uh, he also got $90 a month to play for Norfolk. Uh, in the Class B Piedmont League. That's a lot of money. It's not a lot of money. For that time? Well, $500 was good, but $90 a month had to cover his oh. rent, too. Like I said, I'm gonna, so uh, his, his father was uh, pretty skeptical at first, but the family convinced him to at least let him try. Uh, but years later, he told his father if he'd let his brothers go play, too, he'd be a millionaire. And he said, blame your mom. Blame your mom. <laughs> <laughs> blame your mom. Uh, Yogi learned a lot about taking the Yankees on their word about his bonus. So apparently there was a clause that said he had to he wouldn't get paid until he lasted the entire season in Norfolk. What? Yeah. How, long, mean, how long start to finish? The, the, that's the signing bonus. So like he'd still get the ninety a month, but like I say, that had to cover rent. Oh, okay. And so he'd quickly run out of money. He'd borrow money from a teammate, and his mother slipped him money a few times, warning not to let his father know if he wanted to keep playing. Oh yeah, no shit. At one time, at one point, he actually went on a hunger strike, which uh, it got him a small raise. <laughs> Uh, he, oh my gosh! He made it through That's the a year. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Uh, he made it through the year. He was able to collect the sign-in bonus. But this is 1942. Can you think of something that was going on in 1942? The, the World War. World War Two. World. I almost said Civil War. Oh my God! <laughs> this is a history. Not the Civil War. This is, this is a history podcast, and I almost said the Civil War was in 1942. We're not even editing that out either. We're not. Time. 
That was Keith. I said that. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I don't think you that, that, that was You corrected yourself. You corrected yourself. Like, oh, my God. Uh, so, yeah, Yogi turned 18 in 1943. Wow. So he registered, and he was drafted into the Navy. I bet uh, he could whip a grenade like a motherfucker. I Sorry. I didn't read about that, but maybe. You're probably but I right. bet he could. <laughs> so not That's much. A point. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not too much went on early on, uh, but however, while he was at the movies one night, there was an announcement asking for volunteers for rocket ship duty. Rocket ship. In Yogi's words, I didn't know what it meant, but it sounded like something out of Buck Rogers. You know Buck Rogers. Fuck yeah, yeah. I know Buck Rogers. I know Buck Rogers. So the twenty fourth and one half century. <laughs> <laughs> so in fact, it was being part of a six man crew on a Navy rocket boat. Firing rockets at German machine gun defenses on Omaha Beach. See, that's not what I thought. I thought it was a space programming thing. I totally yeah. did, too. I'm like, dang, I would have been like, dude, dude I got Yogi, duped. Yogi Berra in space, that's the greatest thing ever. That could have been cool, but Yogi Berra in World War II. It would have been pretty dope, too. <laughs> well, it is dope because it happened. happened. It, it happened. did happen. <laughs> so it, it was it pre- it's pretty crazy because it was. Uh, they were like the first ones to go out there. Like... Uh, they they led the um, um, D Day. They let they were no the first ones shit. out there. They were to shoot. They were told to shoot at anything that moved. So you're saying Yogi Berra was at D Day? He was absolutely at D Day. Holy yeah. fuck, that's dope. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> knowledge dropped right there. So uh, he was at he was fired at, but he wasn't hit. But he also confirmed he was sent to Utah Beach on D Day as well, uh, as I was going to say. Uh, he would later receive several awards for his bravery, including a Purple Heart. Dude, really? Dude. But yeah, so they would they would be the first. They were shooting at the machine gunners, and so uh, there was times that they would shoot. I mean, they would shoot at planes too. And I guess the first thing that they they shot at was actually one of their own. And uh, he was parachuting down, screaming at him at the whole time, <laughs> saying, "If you guys would shoot at the the enemy the way you're shooting at us, we'd have won the goddamn war a long time ago." <laughs> uh, so. Uh, <laughs> In January of 1945, he reported to the submarine base in New London, Connecticut. They uh, had a pretty good baseball team there that would barnstorm. Do you know what barnstorm is? I don't is? know. What is that? So uh, professional athletes would travel to various locations, like small towns, and they would play exhibition games against other professional teams. Oh. And so they would, uh, the ones that were in the military, they were actually not supposed to do it. It was frowned upon, but they would make pretty good. They'd make about 50 bucks a game, which that's pretty good. He was making <coughs> 90 bucks a month. That was the hey. dogs, guys. Sorry. <laughs> and there we go. Hey, there we go. Hey, They're excited. So uh, anyway, Yogi is able to eventually make it onto the team. Uh, he, they played a game against the New York Giants, an exhibition team. That's so cool, because they weren't supposed to, right? Well, I mean, no, no they're really not supposed to. <laughs> uh, and uh, he had a few hits off some really bad pitches. And so uh, <clears throat> the Giants manager, Mel Ott, was impressed, and he went to the Yankees' new part owner, Larry McPhail, and offered them 50000 for Yogi. Not, that, w- that wouldn't go to Yogi. That would go to the Yankees. But so they offered to buy him. They for offered to buy him, yeah, for the, for the Giants. Uh, Larry McPhail had actually never seen Yogi, but he figured if the Giants were offering this kind of money for the guy, he must be some. So he set up a meeting. Yogi Bear was five foot seven, 194 pounds. And this what does that compare to an average player today? It's a uh, very small and <laughs> awkward because 194 at five foot seven is a pretty big awkward. It's a bulky, <clears throat> small <Yeah>. guy. <clears throat> so it's not a, I, you know, the ideal form of a, p- a potential star baseball player. But <laughs> McPhail would later say. Here was a funny-looking guy in a sailor suit. He had a homely face, no neck, and the build of a sawed-off weightlifter. <laughs> My first thought was, do I turn down fifty thousand dollars for this? Never have I, I, never have I seen anyone who looked less like an athlete. Dude, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Do you take exception if somebody says you look like a sawed-off bodybuilder or a weightlifter? I would be like, thanks. Somebody in the offering fifty thousand dollars for you back then. No, but, that's but, pretty. What, but what is cool, a sawed-off? Yeah, no, yeah, it probably what, wasn't a compliment. What does that mean? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I'm just no, like, you're good. I'm like, what does sawed off mean? So, uh, what were we going to say? I was not going to say anything. Oh, that was the dogs. Like, that That's wasn't... the dogs, yes. <laughs> the dogs are going? The dogs are going? <laughs> yeah, I thought that was you trying <laughs> no, to say something. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm just sitting here. 
here like, what are you talking about? It's going to be so great if that's on the mics. But yeah, keep going. So uh, <laughs> ultimately, uh, McPhail decided to keep him, actually. So uh, because of his awkward build, it was decided to turn Yogi into a catcher. Oh. It didn't hurt that he I was catch- confused at what position he really played. Yeah, yeah. Well, he played out- He played outfield, too. Um, but he definitely, uh, they, they turned him into a catcher because uh, they're, they're Current catcher, he was a future Hall of Famer, Bill Dickey. He was just about to retire. Uh. And so uh, uh, McPhail sent Yogi to the Yankees AAA team in Newark, and he did quite well. AAA is like right before. Remember when we had the Tucson mm-hmm. Toros? Yeah, yeah. So that's like the level right before the major leagues. I see. So like a AAA team, like you said, like. So there's single A, double A, triple okay. A. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sometimes there's, you know, lower A. Anyway. Uh, so uh, he was called up to the Yankees and played his first game September 22nd, 1946, which was near the end of the season. Uh, his second at bat in that first game, he had a two-run homer. Many of the veterans on the team still weren't sure to make of this short, stumpy, comic book reading rookie with strange <laughs> grammar, but he definitely could a hit. Uh, his catching, like his defense, was not good though. At really? least not yet. Uh, he had a really he had a rocket arm, but with no accuracy. Uh, he had trouble blocking pitches in the dirt. He had no clue what pitches to call, which is huge. <laughs> and because he had really short fingers, it was hard for the pitchers to read the signs oh, he put down. I just, I, I, I just put that together that he was the guy doing all like the yeah the, yeah he put down like one fastball. I just, I just put that together. Popsicles They're like, like what does fingers? that say, dude? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, man? Is he flipping us off? <laughs> That's what I'd make him do: put popsicle sticks in his fingers. <laughs> yeah. I think he, they said he he like painted his fingernails or did something to his fingernails one time, and the pitchers didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as a hitter, though, he didn't have a very adva- advanced approach. Basically, he swung at anything he could reach, like the guy earlier that he delivered papers to, Doug Madwick. His manager once told him to think before he swung. With that advice in his head, he struck out. It confused him. He told the manager, how can a guy think and hit at the same time? <laughs> Which brings us to our first yogiism. Do you know, do you know any yogiisms off the top of your head? Do you know off the top of my head, but I looked because this motherfucker makes me laugh. <laughs> Like I've got a list right here. Uh, you observe a lot by watching. Oh yeah, that that's one that right off the top. That, that's hilarious. <laughs> it's like deja vu all over again. I uh-huh. like that one. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I like them all though. They're all funny. There's one on here that it says number one. I don't know if I can attribute this to Yogi Berra or not, but it says it ain't over till it's over. That's him. Who said it? No. Shit. So there's actually eight that were in uh, Bartlett's uh, familiar quotations of that were from Yogi. Really? Eight of them, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, Yogi became very well known for sayings like, I never said most of the things I said. <laughs> but the writers picked up on them, and it only added to the legend of Yogi Bear. The future ain't what it used to be. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Another good one came with photos of him and teammate Charlie Keller, who wasn't known for his looks either. Yogi replied, so I'm ugly. I never saw anybody hit with his face. <laughs> <laughs> that's Dude, my lo- favorite. That's such a good one. I just love his, I love his logic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. They all are, they have, none of them make sense, but they all make sense. They make, yeah. They make, they in make, a certain way, if you take it literally, it doesn't make sense. They make Yogi but, sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What was the funeral one? What is that one? Uh, yeah. It is uh, always go to every, always go to other people's funerals. Otherwise, they won't come to yours. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the 1947 season was Yogi's official rookie year. So 47, uh, 47. holy 47. shit. The Yankees dealt with several injuries that year, including star outfield Joe DiMaggio for part of the year. But So he played, he played with a bunch of big-time players. You're going to hear some. But their pitching was solid. And as Yankee at that time, he was surrounded by a tradition of going all out on the field and always pulling for one another. One time he was upset at himself for a poor at bat and sort of moped out to his position. He was playing right field that day. Uh, Joe DiMaggio went over to him and said, always run out to your position, kid. It doesn't look good when you walk. The other team may have gotten you down, but don't let them know it. That's solid advice. Yeah, I, I like that quote. Uh, it, eventually, his bat earned him an everyday spot in the lineup with many more coming at catcher. They pretty much dominated the league that year, uh, leading second place Detroit by 12 games in the standings. The uh, Yankees dominated the Yankees. so many years. Oh, Especially like... then, man. Um, and so at this time, whoever won each league went to the World Series. And so oh, it was no. just, there was a seven game series, first to win four games. Uh, so if you win four straight, that's over. If you, you know, might go to seven games if you each split. So um, just, just so you know how it worked back then. 
Uh, so they made it to the World Series, and they faced off against Jackie Robinson and the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers. Get used to hearing that. I know Jackie Robinson. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, in what would be the first World Series ever televised. Oh, really? shit. Uh, reporters asked him, uh, Yogi, how he felt he was going to do against the speedy Dodgers, especially Jackie Robinson running the bases against him. Uh, Yogi played against Jackie Robinson in, in the minors, uh, and he said uh, he wasn't trying to bl- uh, brag, but Jack- Jackie hadn't stolen against him when they played against each other. <laughs> nice. The Dodgers, unfortunately, ran all over him. Of course. <laughs> they stole five, ga- sti- five bases in the first two games of the series. Uh, the Yankees did win those two games, but he was benched for the third game. Oh. They, they put a different catcher in. And so uh, uh, he did end up pinch hitting that game, the third game, and he became the first player in Major League history to hit a pinch hit home run in the World Series. Explain what that is. So uh, when you don't start and you bat for somebody else, when they oh. somebody else, uh, like they'll bring a, a match up or something. I know what that is. Yeah. Now, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, the the... the uh, pitcher was Ralph Branca. He's a future teammate, and he'd actually end up giving up another famous home run I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, they ended up playing all seven games that series, and Yogi would be a world champion for the world time. They ended up winning, uh, but definitely not the last time. <laughs> he's, so, such, he's like already seems like such a character. <laughs> and uh, so 1948 would definitely not be one of the years that he won, <laughs> uh, but it was the year he met his wife, Car- oh, his wife Carmen. They were married January 26th of 1949 was with his buddy Joe Garagiola as his best man. Nice. The year didn't go as planned for the defending champion Yankees, and their manager was fired after just one bad year. Bucky Harris was fired. Wow. So they brought in Casey Stengel. Uh, he, was not a, he was not seen as a good hire at the time, uh, but that opinion would have aged very poorly. Casey Stengel? Casey Stengel. So uh, Casey let it be known immediately that if Yogi plays, it'll have to be behind the plate because the other uh, Bucky Harris was playing him a bit in the outfield too. Uh, so they brought in Bill Dickey, the, the catcher that was uh, the future Hall of Famer, and they brought oh, him yeah, in to teach. Him. Yeah. He was an excellent defensive catcher. So uh, Yogi would actually go on to say, I owe everything that I did into baseball to Bill Dickey. To Bill Dickey? He's, yep. He said he made, uh, well, so he made Yogi into like a really good defensive catcher, but he did push him hard. Uh, so the Yankees had a solid lead uh, that year until the end of the year when they started to drag a bit, and the Boston Red Sox caught up. And actually, took them, they took first place with two games left, and uh, they were going to be played at Yankee Stadium. Uh, but if Boston won either of those games, they were going to be the ones going to the World Series. Nice. But uh, the Yankees did win. Uh, both the games, they ended up getting matched up with, guess who? The Dodgers. Brooklyn Dodgers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this time they won uh, four of the five games that were played. So uh, this would be uh, the first of five straight World Series championships. Uh, it's a for, feat the, for the Yankees? For the Yankees. And that's never been, it's not been matched since. Nice. Nobody's ever won five straight again. Uh, that off-season, uh, off-season, Yogi and Carmen had their first son, Larry. Uh, because baseball wasn't as well paying in the late '40s as it is more in recent times, uh, he was making about twelve thousand that year in 1949. Damn, that's not. Dude, yeah. twelve thousand! Like I, I feel your pain, man. I barely make more than that right now. Right, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, so he, he did take a job in the off season. Uh, he worked as a greeter in a restaurant back in St. Louis six nights a week. Oh, wow. As a former two-time World Series champion, he still had to work six nights a week in the offseason. That's crazy compared to now where yeah. oh, people are just They like... work out. That's what they do. Yeah. yeah. No, that's not all they do. But, but Well, no, yeah. but I'm saying, I'm <laughs> yeah. saying but now it, it, it's... We look at their they're houses. They're paid so much more. Their houses and their cars and their... The money, like the fucking salary they get is pretty huge. Pretty yeah, crazy, I yeah. mean, compared to back then, oh, they, yeah. they got... I wonder what the high, what's the highest paying sport, right? Do you know that? Not MMA, maybe MMA. Uh, I I wouldn't know. I wouldn't even have thought to include MMA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they get like there's some purses that are like ten million dollars for about, one like, fight. Well, how many yeah. fights in a year though? Because maybe base, baseball players maybe get th- maybe three. Because baseball player, there's some that get over thirty million a year. Fuck yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. What about like even like the X Games and stuff? Some of those good, guys yeah. make some pretty good yeah. money too. Yeah. Um, we'd have to look into that. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Again, he had issues with the Yankees owners when it came time for contract negotiations. 
The Yankees offered him 16000 for the upcoming season, but Yogi felt he was worth more as a main contributor of a team that had just won the World Series. Five times in a row? But Well, yeah. No, not quite. He, that's, History. I kind of told you guys that before it happened. Yeah, okay. But he's, he's won two by this point. Okay. Oh, uh, still, yeah. Wait still. to confuse me, Jacob. <laughs> well, I mean, I was just giving you a heads up. <laughs> um, so... <clears throat> he led the team. He was gonna. He led the team in RBIs that year, which he would go on to do for seven straight years. And he also would lead all catchers in home runs and RBIs for nine straight years, from 90, 1949 to 1957. Obviously, the owners wouldn't have any way of knowing not all that that he would go on to be that good. But they are kind of ignoring what they see so far. They're just to kind of nickel and dime them, you know. Well, they see a player that they can squeeze, like, all the money they can out of. And they didn't have uh, agents back then or anything. Oh, no so, shit. Yeah, they're just he was nego- managing himself. He was managing right? himself, exactly, yeah. yeah. And he's doesn't seem like the type of guy to be too, like, mathematically... He wasn't, but once he got with Carmen, Carmen actually, they would discuss it themselves. And then she would they would kind of say, this is what we want. And they're going to offer us this, but we will only accept this as a very minimum, you know. So that's um, good. <clears throat> exactly, she kind of set him on a good, a good path there. That's but, good. Uh, he, they finally uh, offered. Uh, they finally settled on eighteen thousand a year when they were. He, they offered him. Uh, and this was in the late forties. This was in uh, the, the, the early fifties. Early fifties. Yeah. So uh, at one point, reporters asked manager Casey Stengel if Yogi's sour contract dealings and shortened spring training would affect his play. He replied, "He replied, I don't see how. Sure, his feet stick out wrong, and he doesn't seem to do anything right, but he always <laughs> murders the ball. And when he's behind the plate, my pitchers win. What else can my, any manager expect of a catcher? His feet right. stick out. He's, what is it? He, his feet stick out. He stands funny. He, sure, his feet stick out wrong, and he doesn't seem to do anything right. But he always murders the ball. Yes, he does. <laughs> so, uh, in the summer of 1950, the Yankees brought up a scrappy infielder named Billy Martin and a fresh young pitcher with a nasty curveball. You know who that is? I do. Whitey Ford. What? Oh, Whitey yeah, Ford. You no know Whitey Ford. Yeah, yeah, I do you know, know Whitey Ford. Yeah. Uh, Yogi and the two young guys hit it off was, right away. I wasn't sure if that's who you were referring to. Oh, yeah. Because I do know that player. Like, yeah, randomly, just, we were I talking about that. it. Yeah, sorry. I kind of put no, you on no, the spot. Well, I do know that. But yeah, yeah. Just so you guys know, I knew what he was saying. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, Yogi and the two young guys, Billy Martin and Whitey Ford, they, they hit it off right away, even rooming together for a while. But it didn't last long because Yogi was one to get up at 6 a.m. And Willie, uh, Whitey and Billy liked to stay out late. Ah. So... Uh, so but he didn't really go out on the town or anything. He like was that. no, he was an early, early guy. Yeah, he was one of the first ones to get there and all that kind of stuff. Nice. Uh, so by s- September that year, there was a three-team race between between the Detroit Tigers, Boston Red Sox, and the Yankees. Uh, September it's the last month, so there's really no room for error. Uh, the Yankees had a matchup with Detroit uh, and with Whitey starting, and he had uh, through eight innings. He only allowed one run. And then the Yankees scored seven runs in the ninth. Holy shit. And they won eight to one, and they held on to first place for the remainder of the year. That's crazy. So they, they clinched on the third to last day of the season. And they matched up with? The Dodgers. The Dodgers. Nah, the Philadelphia Phillies oh, this time. He pulled us. <laughs> she was ready, too. We both, we, both pulled, we were both like, Dodgers, Dodgers, it's the Dodgers, right? But, but it will be more. Watch. Uh, uh, <laughs> this time in the world, watch, too. Watch, or is it? Listen. Listen. Listen, yeah, got me. Edutainment. Uh, although all the games were close, the Yankees won four straight with Whitey finishing them, finishing, finishing them off in the last one. But uh, the off season came and went, which uh, of course brought contract issues. Which uh, Yogi feeling that forty thousand dollars wasn't unreasonable. They just won back to back World Series. Hell yeah! Uh, Yankees GM George Weiss strongly disagreed and offered him twenty two thousand dollars, just a slight raise. Uh, Yogi again decided to hold out, and the owner blasted him in the pa- uh, papers for it. Uh, eventually, Casey convinced ownership to compromise, and Yogi signed for 30000 So uh, 1951 saw a 19-year-old switch-hitting stud who was, already be calling, who was already being called a mix between Babe Ruth and Joe DiMaggio. He joined the team. He joined uh, the Yankees? Yep. Uh, while Yogi was home in St. Louis shortly before spring training started, he heard a story that the kid was told to report to rookie instructional camp, but he hadn't shown yet. Uh, when the Yankees sent a telegram asking why he hadn't shown, he wired back 
that nobody had sent him money to buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! You know that? Yeah. Any guess who that might have been? No, who is it? The, uh, Mickey Mantle. Oh, Ooh, that would have been my guess. Dang it! <laughs> that's gangster. That's gangster. Like, yeah. that's, like, that's pretty funny. He didn't buy me a ticket. How, how am I gonna get there? Am I supposed to pay to get there yeah. myself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the 1951 season was a tough one. That was jo- uh, Jody, Joe DiMaggio was getting older and announced an early, he announced early on that it would be his last season. So it was w- Mickey's first season, Joe DiMaggio's last season. Hmm. Uh, Whitey was drafted into the Korean War, and uh, Mickey struggled a lot. Uh, he was sent to the minors for a while to get his confidence back. And uh, the Yankees had to fight off the Red Sox again, as well as the Cleveland Indians and the Chicago White Sox. And it came down to the final week again. Uh, in a game against the Red Sox, with a chance to clinch, Yankees pitcher Allie Reynolds had a no-hitter going with two outs in the ninth inning. And they were facing future Hall of Famer and probably the best hitter, one of the best hitters of all time, Ted Williams. Hmm. Uh, Reynolds had already thrown one no-hitter earlier that year. And he would, if he threw this second one, it would be only the second time that it ever happened, two in one season. What's a no hitter? I'm sorry. The whole game, nobody gets a hit. So like a, a, like a single whole, double. Yeah, you can get a walk or you can reach on an error. But uh, a perfect game is when they get 27 batters up, 27 outs. Nobody reaches base or anything. Mm-hmm. So a no hitter is if they just get no hits. Have you ever seen that happen? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I watched uh, not in person, but I watched Randy Johnson throw a, pitch, a perfect game. Nice. Yeah, for the Diamondbacks. All right, so two outs, bottom or ninth inning, no hitter going on. Chance to clinch a playoff spot. Uh, so Ted Williams pops up a foul ball, and Yogi hits under it, and a gust of wind catches it, and he misses it. That sucks. With a chance to clinch the playoffs with a no hitter, with a chance for for history. It's only the second time it would have happened. So uh, uh, the pitcher Reynolds tells him, "Don't worry, Yogi. We'll we'll get him." And uh, as Yogi gets back into position behind the plate, Ted Williams starts ripping into him for blowing a no-hitter and said he was going to bear down even more and make him pay for the mistake. That sucks. It was an act of God. So the pitcher Reynolds throws the same pitch. Williams again pops it up, and Yogi makes the catch. Clinch the, make the catch, uh, finish the no-hitter, and clinch the pennant. Nice. So, nice. It worked. So the out. guy yelled at him for like nothing. Well, he he talked some shit and it didn't go out how he thought it would. <laughs> <laughs> so the Yankees' opponent was going to be decided by a three-game playoff between the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, the Dodgers had a four-to-one lead entering the ninth inning of that last game, and Yogi was watching this game with a teammate, and he figured it was over, so they left early. Uh, so he remembers he was on the George Washington Bridge with the radio on. Dodgers pitcher Ralph Branca, the pitcher Yogi hit that first ever pinch hit World Series home run off of. What do you think he did? I don't know. He gave up a three run home run, game winning home run to Bobby Thompson, and what would go on to be called the shot heard around the world. Oh, uh, and probably the still the most famous home run of all time. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. Yeah. A rookie yeah, Willie too. Mays was on that Giants team. Have you heard of Willie Mays? Oh hell yes. yeah. Okay. Uh, in Game Two of the World Series, many Yankee fans know all too well. Willie hit a fly ball to deep right center field between Mickey and Joe DiMaggio. And remember, DiMaggio's getting older, so it was no secret that DiMaggio had lost a step in center field. So as told by Mickey, I was running as hard as I could to get over to it because Casey had told me before the game about how Joe had slowed up a little bit, he thought. Well, anyways, when I get there, Joe's already standing under the ball. He said, I got it. (laughs) <laughs> and you don't want to run into Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> so when I tried to stop, I was going as fast as I could. My back cleat and my spike stuck in a rubber drain. And when it did, my knee went right out through the <gasps> front of my leg. And I just folded up on the field. Oh, oh that was who? Mickey Mantle. Uh. Mickey Mantle, really? He played the rest of his career with a torn ACL. Never regaining his speed from before the injury. Oh my, oh my god. god! He was just a couple weeks shy of twenty years old, so he played pretty serious? much his whole career. It was, this is his first year. He didn't even make it through his rookie season. He's a Hall of Famer, so he obviously played for a long time. But why would they have that out there? Like, so like bad. that was like <laughs> like almost like a booby trap. Yeah, like yeah. that's. A, I don't know. Hopefully, they don't do that anymore, and they're more cautious considering how much these baseball players are worth. Well, I mean, fortunately, they are better at repairing ACLs now. But no, but you're yeah, right. But still, you're right. once it's once it's broke, it's yeah. just never the same again. Yeah. Anytime you're opened up, you're never the same afterwards. 
so the Giants got out to a two to one series lead. Remember, it's four, best of four, or uh, first of four. So, uh, and before game four, Casey, the manager, called the team together and he said, You have not done well, and the manager has not done well, but we are going to be all right if you just go out and play the way you can. And I commence managing as I should be managing. We have all been lousy together. Now let's all be goddamn good. Nice. And that's what happened. They won the next three games to win their third straight World Series. Yogi was named American League MVP for the first time, and his second son, Tim, was also born that year. Uh, in 1950, uh, 1952, uh, that was going to be the first year without their leader, Joe DiMaggio. They struggled. So it's the first year he retired? Yeah, yeah, he had retired, yeah. Uh, they struggled early on. They actually ended up in fifth place at one point. Uh, they did get hot. They had jumped to first place, but it came down to the very end where they had to win 13 of their last 15 games, and they only won by two games that year. Uh, so that year, Yogi hit 30 home runs, which at the time was the most ever for a catcher. Nice. Wow. And they were matched up in the World Series with guess who? Dodgers. Dodgers this time. I was guessing. I was guessing. Uh, they split the first two games of the series. Uh so it was 1-1. One, one. Uh, in game three, Yogi hit a home run. Uh, unfortunately, in Brooklyn's next at bat, Pee Wee Reese and Jack, uh, Jackie Robinson both singled, and then they pulled off a double steal. You know that is? No. it's they, So they're on first and second, and they end up on second and third. Oh, shit. Okay. Uh, and so uh, <clears throat> then uh, the next, there's a, a wild pitch by the pitcher, and, and it went past Yogi. He wasn't able to find it. So both runners scored on the one play. Nice. Uh, the Dodgers won that game 5-3. to three, And so they went ahead in the series 2-1. to one. Uh, The Yankees then tied up the series with a 2 to nothing shutout in game 4. But then the Dodgers went up 3-2. to two. So uh, one game away from winning the World Series. And they were both going to be at the Dodgers home stadium, Ebbets Field. Nice. Uh, so you get the advantage there and playing at home. Uh, in game 6, the Dodgers were up 1 to nothing. Uh, going into the seventh inning, Yogi homered to tie it, and then Mickey Mantle homered, uh, to, and they went they went ahead and they won. Uh, so it goes to game seven. Uh, in the decisive game seven, the Yankees held a 4-2 to lead in the seventh. Uh, the Dodgers loaded the bases with one out, with Duke Snyder and Jackie Robinson coming up. Uh, Snyder popped out, and then Jackie hit a pop-up too. The first baseman lost it in the sun. Uh, the rest of the infield froze, so with two outs, all the runners are running. If the ball falls, it's, all three of them are going to score. Uh, but in comes run, running uh, second baseman Billy Martin, makes a catch at his knees, and ends the rally. They ended up winning 4-2, to two, and so they had officially tied the record for four straight World Series. The most uh, That was uh, Lou Gehrig and Joe DiMaggio from 1936 to 39. That was the, uh, the most ever at the time. Now they had uh, tied that. Uh, hmm. So this is fi- uh, the fifth one already for Yogi, f- five World Series. Nice. Uh, <clears throat> the 1950 season, uh, 53 seasons when Mickey Mantle gave us the term tape measure home run. So with uh, Yogi on first base, Mantle hit a monster home run that was measured at 565 feet. Jesus. Wow. So some historians have argued the distance, saying that it was more likely about 515 on the fly and that it probably bounced another 20 or 30 feet. But Who cares, either man. way, it's when they started measuring the distance of home runs because they were yeah. monster home runs. Uh, Yogi struggled for a while during the season. He had a virus, uh, but he changed up his diet a, bit, uh, diet a bit. and He managed to finish with pretty good numbers for the year. Uh, they clinched in early September five straight times. They were the best team in the American League, and they did it all with many of the same guys. Uh, Yogi had a trivia question that only the most diehard fans could answer. Is, uh, who are the 12 guys that played on the five straight championships from 1949 to 1953? I, I'd be willing to bet most lifelong yeah. baseball fans can't answer this. Uh, maybe even two. <laughs> so uh, they were Gene Woodling, Eddie Lopat, Allie Reynolds, Hank Bauer, Vic Rashi, Joe Collins, Bobby Brown. You didn't know Bobby Brown played Bobby baseball? Brown. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a different Bobby Brown. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Charlie Silvera, Jerry Coleman, Johnny Mize, Yogi, and Phil Rizzuto. Remember Rizzuto from Billy Madison? I do. <laughs> uh, they matched up with uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, Yogi hit a home run in game one, and they won uh, a high-scoring game 9-5. to five. Uh, D- President Dwight Eisenhower watched the game on TV and mentioned Yogi in his press conference, saying, I received a terrific kick out of Yogi Berra's home run. <laughs> that fellow really slammed it out of the park. <laughs> 
Uh, Yogi actually met or interacted with every president from Harry S. Truman, so from 1945, oh, wow. that president, uh, to President Trump. Uh, wow. Nixon was actually a big fan of Yogi, <clears throat> and he liked to tell a story about Yogi meeting the wives of the Milwaukee Braves during the 1957 World Series. One of the wives told Barra he looked cool. He replied, you don't look so hot yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, also, George W. Bush talked about Yogi being an inspiration to him. Not only because of his baseball skills, but of course for the enduring mark he left on the English language. <laughs> Some in the press corps think he might even be my speechwriter. That's funny. The Yankees won the second game of the series. The Dodgers then came back and won two to tie it up. But the Yankees came out strong in game five, winning 11-7. to seven, And then Billy Martin drove in the game-winning run in the bottom of the ninth in game seven. And they had officially broken the world record for five straight. Oh, yeah. Wow. <clears throat> uh, in uh, 1954 and 1955, Yogi uh, won his third and f- or second and third American League MVPs. Uh, in 1954, the Yankees won 103 games, the most they would win under Casey Stengel, but Cleveland won 111 that year, so they didn't even make the playoffs. And then the Indians would go on to get swept by Willie Mays and the New York Giants. Uh, in 1955, the Yankees faced, guess who? Dodgers? The Dodgers. The Dodgers. Again. <laughs> uh, in game one of the series, Jackie Robinson was on third base and pulled a daring steal of home. Uh, he was called safe. Yogi jumped into the umpire's face arguing the call, but to no avail. Until his dying days, you would swear Jackie was out. You could say, uh-huh. uh, hey, Yogi, uh, what about Jackie? He was out. He was out. <laughs> he was out. Uh, they didn't have replay back then, so the call stood. And the Dodgers would lose that game, but would eventually go on to win their first championship in franchise he- uh, history in a thrilling seven-game series. Uh, Yogi had a chance to tie up the game in the seventh game, but uh, Brooklyn left fielder Sandy Amaros made a great run- running catch, and the game ended 2 to nothing. Uh, that offseason, Yogi was signed to a $50,000 contract. Damn, that's quite a pay bump. Finally getting a little bit of respect. He had been getting raises each year, but basically had to threaten to not play if he wasn't getting what he thought was fair. But now with three MVPs and six World Series rings to his name, I finally got a little respect. Oh, with yeah. the caveat being that he fi- he had to get his batting average up to 300. It was around 272 the previous year. Mm. But he'd been up there around 300 other years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, he was getting some more time in the outfield again, uh, not only to give him a bit of a break from playing catcher, but also to give playing time to Elston Howard. The Yankees were one of the last teams to integrate, so often trading off their talented black players, which eventually brought criticism by pressure groups. Uh, a really bad cro- uh, quote from their GM, George Weiss, Weiss, was that Ellie was the first black player good enough to play for the Yankees. Oh, man. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah. That's fucking rough. Uh, he was already 26 when the Yankees got him, but he was a stud, having played in the Negro Leagues for a couple of years. Oh, yeah. Um, that year, 1956, Mickey ha- uh, had what's called a triple crown season where he led the league in batting average, home runs, and RBIs. And in fact, at one point, he was threatening to beat Babe Ruth's uh, 60 home run record in a season, but he ended up in, finishing. In a single season? Yep, in a single season. We ended up with 52. <laughs> Uh, the Yankees, as a, as a team, broke the American League record for home runs in a season set by the 1936 Yankees. Uh, Yogi had one of his best seasons, again hitting 30 home runs with 105 RBIs and a 298 average. Remember, he was trying to be close to 300. Yep. And he broke Cubs catcher Gabby Hartnett's career record for most home runs by a, correct, uh, by a catcher. Uh, what's most impressive about that is that Hartnett played for 20 seasons, and this was Yogi's 10th when he broke it. <laughs> uh, Yogi also got involved in opening a bowling alley with uh, Phil Rizzuto, and uh, he became the face of the franchise for his favorite drink, Yoo-Hoo. you Dude, yeah. I love me some you Yeah, love me, me too. Some I love that it's chocolate drink. Right. Oh, and it, I think uh, now it says chocolate soda. Yeah, yeah we, we yeah, had that discussion right, yeah. before, and then yeah. that, that we never looked it up. A funny story that may or may not be true. Uh, apparently, he was at the bottling factory one day in, in an executive's, off, executive's office when the phone rang. He answered, and a woman asked if Yoo-Hoo was hyphenated. <laughs> Yogi replied, no, ma'am, it's not even carbonated. That's a li- <laughs> I love his, the way his brain works. The Yankees cruised to the playoffs with a nine-game lead over second-place Cleveland. 
They were matched up with guess who? Dodgers. 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 Again, after losing er, after losing game one, the Yankees chose Don Larson to pitch game two. He had been added to the team in 1955 as part of a 17-player trade. Damn. Coming off a year in which he had three and 21. That's three wins and 21 losses. Damn. Not good. Uh, so so the, they were getting a player that had that record? Yep. They picked up this guy. They, they figured he had some potential in other ways. I, I don't He's gotta see win why. Some, He's got to win sometime. Yeah. So in the second inning of this game, Yogi hit a grand slam, and the Yankees got out to a six-run lead, but Larson was wild, and he couldn't hold the lead, being taken out in the second inning in what would be a 13-8 to loss. Damn. Oh, my god! The guy that went 3-21 and the previous year. The fans went nuts after the game, chanting, the Yankees are dead, the Yankees are dead. Oh, my God. The Yankees won because they had just previous lost the previous two World Series, or the previous two seasons they hadn't won the World Series. Uh, so the Yankees did win games three and four, and uh, when Don Larson was again chosen to pitch again in the pivotal game five, uh, reports are that Don Larson was out on the town the night before, likely thinking he was done for the series. In game five, he lasted 97 pitches. That's still a lot of pitches. It's a lot of pitches. It's good enough. He never once shook off a sign that Yogi put down. Mickey hit a home run in the fourth inning, and a second run was added in the sixth. After the seventh inning, Don Larson was smoking a cigarette in the dugout between innings when he realized the situation and said to Mickey, Look at the scoreboard, Mick. Wouldn't it be something? Two more innings to go. Mickey immediately got up without saying a word and left Larson by himself. <laughs> it's considered very bad luck to speak to a pitcher during a no-hitter, I, much less a yeah. perfect game in the World Series. I, right? I, At this point, the, uh, he had a, a perfect game. Going. I, I didn't know that until you mentioned it a few weeks back. Yeah. I didn't realize that that superstition, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yep. So entering the ninth inning, not a single batter has reached. Yogi said to him, let's get the first batter. That's the important thing. The first hitter flew out to right field. The second hitter grounded out. Next to bat, with two outs in the ninth inning of the World Series with a perfect game on the line, Dale Mitchell comes in to pinch hit. Larson got ahead one ball and two strikes, then threw a fastball that even Yogi admits was a borderline strike. The umpire called strike three for the first perfect game thrown in a playoff game. Still to this date, only 23 have ever been thrown, not once in the playoffs since. Uh, there's video of Yogi jumping up and bear-hugging Larson after the last pitch. <laughs> Yogi and his wife had their third child a couple months later. They named him Dale Barra, named after Dale Mitchell, who made the final out of that perfect oh, game. Oh, <laughs> dude, that's badass. Dale Barra, that's a cool name, too. Dale, Dale Barra. Barra. That's a cool name. Prior to this series, Yo Yogi had received news that his mother would be getting her leg amputated in an attempt to save her life from the effects of diabetes. Aww. He wanted to come home and be with her, but Pietro said the best thing would be for him to play. Uh, he asked her if there if uh, he asked his wife uh, he asked his mom Paulina if there was anything he could do for her. Paulina said, "Hit a home run for me." The Yankees lost Game Six, one to nothing, so no homer. <laughs> but Yogi hit a two-run homer in the first inning of Game Seven for her. Then hit a second two-run homer in the third for good measure, and the Yankees went on to win nine to nothing for Yogi's seventh World Series. <laughs> Jeez. After the game, Jackie Robinson came into the Yankee, cl in the Yankee clubhouse, put his arm around Yogi, and told reporters that he was one of the best clutch hitters he'd ever seen. Nice. This would be Robinson's last game and the last time the Yankees would play the Brooklyn Dodgers in the playoffs as they moved to uh, California with the New York Giants two years later. In 1957, Yogi had his worst year as a hitter, thus far at least. Uh, one night, some of the team were going out to celebrate Billy Martin's birthday, and Yogi didn't really want to go, but Carmen convinced him it might help him take his mind off his struggles. After dinner, they all went out to the Copacabana nightclub to hear the Sammy Copa, Davis Jr. Copacabana. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're good. Uh, a drunk was heckling Davis, so shouting some racist, oh, racist I like shit. This story. And the Yankees players, being fans of Sammy, told the guy to shut it. One thing led to another, and a drunk ended up with a broken nose. Uh, the GM never really liked Billy. He considered him a bad inf influence on the team and blamed the whole thing on him, ultimately trading him to t Kansas City. Wow. Uh, Phil Rizzuto used to say, the year Billy roomed with me, I was MVP. The year he roomed with Yogi, he was MVP. And the year he roomed with Mickey, he was MVP. Some bad influence. <laughs> right? The Yankees won the pennant again, and Mickey won his second MVP in a row. But uh, Yogi in battled injuries all year. 
They did make it to the World Series. They went seven games against the Milwaukee Braves, but Don Larson gave up three runs in the third inning, and the Yankees never recovered. This would be just the second time in nine World Series appearances that Yogi would be on the losing team. Uh, 1958 was when a cartoon character created by Hanna-Barbera hey, made his woo-hoo. appearance on the Huckleberry <laughs> Hound Show. I don't know, Yogi. <laughs> Yogi, the player, made his debut in Major League Baseball in 1946. By 1955, Yogi had won three MVPs and seven World... That's 1958. I fucked up. By 1958, Yogi had won three <laughs> MVPs and seven World Series. Yogi strongly considered suing Hanna-Barbera for defamation. Joseph Barbera would say, Yogi Berra doesn't play baseball, and Yogi Berra was not passionate about picnic baskets, <laughs> but undoubtedly, the sound of the name was awash in our collective unconscious at a time when Yogi Berra was a very popular figure. Yeah, that's where my mind goes. He just decided to let it go. But this is similar to another uh, with uh, Baby Ruth candy bar. Uh, yep. Baby so Ruth, yeah. Do you know what that's named after? Baby Ruth? It's named after, apparently, it's named after... Uh, Quote, Grover, Quote. President Cleveland's daughter, Baby Ruth. Really? She had died 19 years before the candy bar came out. And the year before the candy bar came out, Babe Ruth hit 59 uh, home runs. So you tell but, me you think the fucking yeah. candy bar is made after. Uh, yeah, yeah. They were capitalizing on Ruth's success. And oh, so, yeah. but, it makes me think of the good. And they didn't want to give him any money, so they said it was... It makes me think of the Goonies at Baby Ruth. I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's my favorite part. Sloth Love Chunk. <laughs> Sorry. Good. I had to do it. You're good. Hey, I love hey, the Goonies. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Goonies. Good stuff. Anyway, back to Yogi Bear. <laughs> <laughs> the team in 1958 got off to a huge lead and kind of coasted the last few months, finally clinching a few weeks before the season ended. They got their desired rematch with the Milwaukee Braves, but lost the first two games of the series and appeared to be in big trouble. Don Larson was terrific in Game 3, and the Yankees won 4 to nothing. but they were shut out 3 to nothing in Game 4 and one loss away from losing back-to-back World Series. Howard Cosell asked Casey, the manager, if he thought the team was choked up. I always remember, this is Howard Cosell. He replied, if there's any choking, it'll be you on this microphone. <laughs> nice. Yankee. I like that guy. Yeah. He's in a lot of video games. Like, this is Howard Cosell. There's, there's, I, I won't go all into Casey. There's a lot of good. There's a lot of bad. <laughs> Isn't that with everybody? Of course. Of course. Especially of the time. Uh, Yankee pitcher Bob Turley shut out the Braves in Game 5, and then Game 6 went to extra innings with Braves pitcher Warren Spahn going on just two days rest, taking the team into the 10th inning. An exhausted Spahn would give up two runs in the 10th and then get the loss. And then Game 7, it was tied in the 8th inning with two outs when Yogi doubled, starting a rally, followed by a couple singles and then a three-run homer to cap a four-run inning. And the Yankees, a, a, a lead the Yankees would not give up. Yogi now had eight World Series, just one shy of Joe DiMaggio for the first of all time. Nice. Uh, 1959, Yankees finished uh, in a uh, disappointing third place. Yogi broke a record ranging from 1957 to 1959 for most games in a row without an error. Damn. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, 148 games. But it was a tough year for him as his mom, Paulina, passed away. Oh. The team traded away Don Larson, Hank Bauer, and a couple other players to Kansas City for three players, one of which was Roger Maris. Roger, I that name. Yeah, you do. Roger would win the MVP in 1960, hitting in front of Mickey. They played the Pittsburgh Pirates in the World Series, and they outscored the Pirates 55-27 to that World Series. Nice. The Yankees were winning games 16-3, to 10 to nothing, 12 to nothing. But the Pirates used two they key... They were leading in those games. They, they won those games. Yeah, that's what I'm Yeah, saying. exactly, yeah. But the Pirates used two key home runs by second baseman Bill Mazeroski, the second one coming in the bottom of the ninth of Game 7 to edge the Yankees, only outscoring New York by seven runs in their four wins. Before uh, Game 7, Yogi would tell a reporter, don't print this, but we're a much better team. Oh, my God. The, the reporter, confused, said, why don't you want me to print that? Yogi looked at Mickey, who heard the whole conversation, and said, What do you think, Mick? Mantle said, Hell, it's true, ain't it? If you don't want it to be quoted, you can quote me on that. 
<laughs> Mickey Mantle would say this is the only loss he ever cried after. They they were the better. It's 55 to 27. <laughs> yeah, but you've seen a lot of them where it's the better team and something happens and they forever go down. Oh, man. I, yeah, I they, like that. You can quote me on it. Yeah, he's like, fuck it. <laughs> Uh, that offseason, the Yankees let manager Casey Stengel go after winning 10 pennants and seven World Series in 12 years. They said it was because of his age. He was 70 now. And the Yankees decided on a new rule of 65 being a kind of forced retirement age from the franchise. Wow. They, they I mean, signed... if they're winning, why would you do that? You no, know? exactly. Exactly. But they just decided to get new blood in there. They lost. so <laughs> <clears throat> They um, were bitter. So they signed Yogi's former backup catcher, Ralph Houck, as manager. Houck moved Yogi to the outfield full-time with Elston Howard becoming the everyday catcher. Ellie had a monster year, hitting 348, and Whitey won 25 games. But that year, 1961, was the year of Manal Amaris. If you've ever seen the movie 61 or already know of baseball history, you already know, of course. But Mantle and Maris were destroying the ball, both threatening yep. to beat Babe Ruth's record of 60 home runs in a season. Yep. Pop, 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 pop. <laughs> one, one right after the other. Yep. The catch was that this season was an expansion year. They added a couple teams into both leagues, and they added eight games to the, uh, to the schedule. So the commissioner, who was a close friend of Babe's, decided that if the record were to be broken in more than 154 games, there would be an asterisk next to their record. And, oh, that's, that and sucks. Babe would still be listed first. That's bullshit. No, yeah, seriously. It was a huge story all year, with both players having streaky moments where it looked like he'd be the favorite. But Mickey eventually had to pull out of the race after suffering, suffering an abscess in his hip joint caused from an injection that was supposed to cure him of a flu. Oh my gosh! Damn. He just had Bad all kinds, of, all kinds of shit that happened. But he also drank a lot and kind of partied, and so that'll do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, most fans did want Mickey to win it because, being that he was a true Yankee, uh, even booing Maris when he took the lead. Remember, Roger was traded from Kansas City. Mickey came up with the Yankees. Okay. But on the last day of the season, Roger hit number sixty-one, and his home run record, quote unquote, had an asterisk until nineteen ninety-one. Six years after Maris died, so he never knew he was the home run king, although it only lasted for four, or eight years until Mark McGuire broke it in 98. Okay, so that, that was the whole point of the movie. Yes. I remember that. I yeah. remember that now. Uh, <clears throat> as a team, they had six players with over 20 home runs and went on a 13-game winning streak to take the pennant with 109 wins. They matched up with the Cincinnati Reds. I didn't think you guess who. <laughs> that wouldn't have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> who, had, who had four 20 home run, 20 plus homer guys themselves. Mickey would be sidelined most of the series with his leg injury. Yogi had to miss a game after getting a cut over his eye, diving for a ball in left field. Shit, that probably hit him in the face. <laughs> yeah, that, that had to hurt. But the Yankees won the series in five games pretty handily, with Whitey breaking a record of Babe Ruth's pitching 32 straight innings without giving up a run yeah. that's and, insane did you know Bay Ruth used to be a pitcher too i did not know that i, just I thought... actually always thought until recently basically that he was an outfielder yeah he i didn't moved think he did outfield because he's think such he did, a good hitter i didn't think he did anything but but hit the ball oh he was he would pitch <laughs> they're like don't don't just go sit in the benches we'll take care of it until yeah. you gotta until you gotta come up and hit well it's like <laughs> uh, it's like that old uh i forget how the poem goes but you know casey jones yeah. Like I just just kind of a picture like he they, he's he just sits in the dugout and they call him out and you remember do you remember the story of Casey Jones? Yeah 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 I know like, what you're talking he, about. He was, I forget how the rhyme goes, but like he always hits a home run or whatever, and he finally gets struck out, and then he like loses all of his confidence and like he just gets struck out over and over and over Actually, again. Actually, yeah. And then, like the he ends up trying to just hit the ball on the ground. Yeah, and, and I remember saying yeah, it's, it's, it's that, an animation, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was it's like starts raining on him and stuff, and he's like swinging at the bat, dude. I'm, yeah. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna fucking put that at the end of this. <laughs> right nice. On. Casey Jones up to bat. <laughs> so he he uh, Whitey broke this record of pitching 32 straight innings without giving up a run, and uh, as Whitey would later say, it wasn't a good year for the babe, uh, because uh, Roger ended up being the one too. Uh, so 1962 would be the first season Yogi played under 100 games. He made his final All Star. Under 100 games? Yeah, yeah, because there's 100 and there were 154, and then moved to 162. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so uh, <clears throat> he made his final All Star appearance, which I hadn't mentioned yet. Yogi made the All Star team 15 straight years and played in 18 total. 
Uh, from 1959 to 1962, there were actually two All-Star games in a year. They did that to raise money for player pensions. Um, it didn't last long, obviously. <laughs> um, this last appearance was kind of a formality, though, as he had hit, he had his worst hitting season at age 37. The Yankees finished five games ahead of second-place Minnesota and faced the now San Francisco Giants in the World Series. Yogi had just two pinch-hit appearances, but that was his only play in time. The Yankees did go on to win again in seven games, Yogi's record 10th World Series, which still stands, and he appeared in four other ones that they lost. He came back in 1963 as a player coach and played in fewer games than the last, but did hit a bit better. He passed Babe Ruth's record for games played as a Yankee, behind only Lou oh, Gehrig. Wow. <clears throat> Uh, he hit his la- uh, his last hit as a Yankee was a home run. Uh, this year was his final World Series as a player, and by the end of it, he had played seventy five World Series games in his career, more than anyone else. Wow! His last appearance was a pinch hit line out to right field. His last at bat as a Yankee. He retired the following World uh, following the World Series, pardon me, and was hired on as a manager with current manager Ralph Houck being promoted to GM. So he was the Yankees manager for this year. Uh, he was going to be managing a team full of his friends, though, Mickey, Whitey, Elston Howard, all them. So uh, they struggled at first. They battled a ton of injuries, and then the harmonica inju- uh, incident happened. <laughs> the harmonica incident. Oh, yeah. So after getting swept by the Chicago White Sox in four games, the team bus was delayed, taken off of the airport. At the uh, time, reporters would travel with the team. Uh, there was an infielder named Phil Linz. He decided he had time to pull out his n- new little pamphlet that explained how to play the harmonica. So he started trying to play Mary Had a Little Lamb. Uh, Yogi, not knowing or caring who was playing, but was irritated that the team had possibly just been taken out of playoff contention, yelled back, shove that harmonica up your ass. <laughs> Linz didn't hear him. He looked at Mickey sitting next to him, and he said, what did he say? Mickey said, play it louder. <laughs> so he did. And Yogi jumped up and charged at Linz. Uh, Linz flipped the harmonica back at Yogi, caught it, and threw it back, and it hit another player on the knee who jokingly acted like he was injured. <laughs> uh, the story was all over every major paper in the next, the next morning. Uh, it made management think that Yogi wasn't ready to manage, but it actually lit a fire under the team. They came back and won the pennant by one game, and went to the full seven games against Bob Gibson and the St. Louis Cardinals in the World Series. But they lost, and Yogi was let go. After just one year, where he came one game shy of winning a World Series, after winning 10 World Series with him as a player, he was just fired. (laughs) Uh, He was contacted by the New York Mets, where Casey Stengel was actually a manager. Uh, They brought him up to the Mets after uh, they let him go by the Yankees. And uh, he coached under Stengel and then uh, two other managers following Casey's departure after the first year. Uh, The Mets would win the World Series in 1969 with Yogi as a bench coach. And uh, in 1972, when manager, uh, the Mets manager Gil Hodges passed away after su- suffering a sudden heart attack, Yogi was promoted to the Mets manager. Uh, he was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame this year as well as a player. Uh, the Yankees also retired his jersey number eight, which was the same number that Bill Dickey wore. So it's actually retired twice. Uh, oh, with wow. The Yankees. Yeah, so you'll see uh, they have all the, their numbers, and it, it, number eight appears twice. He led the Mets to the World Series in 1973, where they had two chances to close out the Oakland A's, but lost in seven games. So this made Yogi one of just seven managers to lead a team to the World Series in both leagues, the American League and the National League. Uh, He was fired in 1975, getting picked up again as a Yankees coach under Billy Martin. Uh, The Yankees would win the World Series in 1977 and 78 with Yogi as a bench coach, so kind of... He's starting to gain a reputation as having a, a quite a lucky charm to have around. Um, in 1984, Yogi was named the manager again of the Yankees, replacing Billy Martin, who had been fired and rehired several times by this Why time. Why would you keep going back? That's like, so that's like wanting the pain. And it is weird, but it, especially <clears throat> in hindsight, but he had a, a reputation of bringing teams that just had no business in being the playoffs to the playoffs and no no i get it no I get yeah it. But I, if i was him i'd be like god damn it they're just gonna fucking fire me right I'm like fuck this shit <laughs> hey he wanted to be the manager of the yankees he's fine with it he figured <laughs> out but he he had a, also a reputation of getting drunk and getting into fights and stuff and so it looked bad on the team they'd fucking fire him so. <laughs> 
Well, you should have led with that. Yeah, well, fair enough. <laughs> I like to get drunk and fight. Yeah. So uh, he, he'd replaced Billy Martin, who'd been hired and fired several times. The team finished 87 and 75, 17 games behind the eventual uh, champion Detroit Tigers. Uh, the Yankees made a trade with the Pittsburgh Pirates before the 1985 season, adding a young infielder named Dale Barra. So Dale he's, Barra. How do I know that name? Yeah, you should know it. It's his son. Uh-oh. Dale Mitchell. Right? Dale, we talked about him. <laughs> I was just going to say, wait a minute. I was like, wait a minute. minute. I know that name. Okay. Yeah, okay. So Dale actually played really well under his father. Hmm. Uh, Yogi was assured by owner George Steinbrenner that he would not be in jeopardy of losing his job if they got off to a slow start. They did just end up having a bad year. They en- ended up finishing, uh, what did I fucking say? 87 and 75, 17 games back. So uh, that's not a good good look there. Uh, and so, But he was promised by George he, would, he wouldn't be in jeopardy if they got into a bad start. But he changed his mind after 16 games. He sent his GM Clyde King to break the news. So Yogi oh, was re- yeah, is pretty bitch move. Uh, Yogi was pl- replaced by Billy Martin, now managing the team for his fourth of an eventual five stints as an. Oh humanity. my god, <laughs> I, I I could not take it. I bet you fire me and I'm going to fucking kill you. Like, dude, <laughs> stop it. Yogi was accepting of his fate. But Carmen was furious and made Yogi vow not to return to Yankee Stadium while, jo- while jo- George was owner, even with his son on the team. That's Under- fucked up. Right. Under Billy, Dale was returned to a backup infielder, and he struggled. Uh, one interesting thing that will actually give you an idea how much the game changed in this amount of time. So D- in Dale's final year with the Pirates, the year before this, he made more than Yogi did in his entire playing career. Oh, my God. Dale made eight hundred and twenty thousand dollars in nineteen eighty four, and Yogi totaled about six hundred and eighty five thousand in nineteen seasons. That's including World Series bonuses and everything. Whoa! Yeah, so, yeah re- it's re- pretty. Read those crap. numbers again. So Dale made eight hundred and twenty thousand dollars in nineteen eighty four, the one year, while Yogi made six hundred and eighty five thousand in nineteen seasons. Crazy. Uh, but so for 14 long years, Yogi stayed away from Yankee Stadium. Uh, during that time, Yogi went to coach for the Houston Astros, and he retired in 1989. Uh, George Stun- Steinbrenner finally agreed to apologize to Yogi at the opening of the Yogi Berra Museum. Well, duh. So Yogi agreed <laughs> to start. Well, I mean, he needed to. Was, yeah. He wanted him around. Uh, Yogi agreed to start coming back to games. And on July 18th, 1999, the Yankees celebrated the first Yogi Berra Day to welcome him back. They invited Don Larson, the pitcher who threw the first perfect game in the World Series, and Larson threw out the first pitch to Yogi. Nice. Then Yankees pitcher David Cohn then fucked around and threw a perfect game himself that same game (laughs) with Larson and Yogi watching. Uh, Yogi stayed around a bit and helped train Yankees catcher Jorge Posada during spring training. Uh, Yogi. I know Jorge Posada. Yeah, he's. Yeah. Uh, he was much more uh, recent. Um, so Yogi and Carmen lived in their home in New Jersey until Carmen's health started to decline, and they moved into an assisted living facility. Carmen died on March sixth, twenty fourteen, of complications from a stroke at age eighty five. Uh-huh. And then on September twenty second, twenty fifteen, Lorenzo Petro Berra Yogi died in his sleep at age ninety of natural causes. Ninety. I yeah, mean, he had a good run. He did have a good year. Dude, he saw so <laughs> he such much a, in his age. I mean, such think an about interesting that. character. Such an interesting character. The Yankees added a, a, a number eight patch to their uniforms, and so did Dodgers manager Don Mattingly, who was a li- longtime Yankee. Uh, when he when Don Mattingly joined the co- coaching staff of the Dodgers, he actually took uniform number eight and is nice. now the manager of the Mar- uh, Miami Marlins with the same number. Uh, on November 24th, 2015, two months after Yogi's death, uh, President Barack Obama awarded Yogi with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Oh. Obama said, one thing we know for sure, if you can't imitate him, don't copy him. <laughs> nice. That was, that was one of Yogi's uh, Yogi-isms. Nice. So that's it. That's Man, the story of Yogi. D- dude, I just have, uh, I have a bunch of Yogi-isms I wanted to go over, yeah, but that's, yeah. that's the story. Yeah, give, give us a couple more Yogi-isms. Uh, so... Uh, 
one of them is when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> <laughs> so in the podcast with Marty Appel, uh, he's talking about that one. He talks about a few of them. Um, so when Yogi would give directions to his house, there was a fork in the road, and you can go left or right, and you'd end up at the same place. That's funny. So when, when you come to a fork in the road, road take, take it. it. So it makes sense, but it's, <laughs> uh, you can observe a lot just by watching. It ain't over till it's over. I love that one. Yeah, yeah right? I didn't I realize I definitely was... use that one in my yeah, life. Yeah, me too. Presidents use that one. Like, yeah. All kinds of people have used that one. Well, uh, way to just make me feel like Well, no, no, dirt. but I'm saying it's <laughs> like, that's one of the really common This is like, I didn't realize. You know, like, yeah, I've, I've no, heard exactly. that a thousand times. Yeah. Uh, it's like deja vu all over again. Yeah, I like yeah. that one too. <laughs> so this one, he told a Times language columnist in 1987 that he never said this, but later took credit for the quote. Supposedly, he said this as he reacted to back-to-back home runs by teammates Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris. Makes perfect sense to me, he said decades later. <laughs> Uh, no one goes there nowadays. It's too crowded. There's another one. <laughs> it makes too... sense, though. So, yeah. So, Marty Appel explained that one, too. He said that when the team would go to dinner, they, uh, you know, they're a travel team. They would avoid certain places that became too popular that were more frequented by the general population. So, it's nobody from that travel team goes there anymore. It's too crowded. <laughs> uh, baseball is 90% mental, and the other half is physical. That's hilarious. I love that. I love the math. A nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I've heard that one. That one's a good one. That one makes sense if you know about like like nickel candy, dime candy, and stuff like that. Because like, things raised. Well, I, I don't know. It's even like in soda machines and stuff. Remember, you yeah. used to get when we were kids, you could get a soda for a quarter. Oh, yeah. Well, now yeah. it's like $2 for a fucking soda. I remember it used to be uh, one quarter to get on the bus. Now it's a dollar set or two seventy five. <laughs> yeah. Dude, we are aging ourselves yeah. here, but dude. <laughs> Uh, we are, I think we said this one. Always go to other people's funerals. Otherwise, we won't come to yours. We made too many wrong mistakes. I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> this one. Congratulations. I knew the record would stand until it was broken. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> you better cut the pizza in four pieces because I'm not hungry enough to eat six. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I usually take a two-hour nap from one to four. That's awesome. I love, I'm going to start saying that, actually. <laughs> Never answer an anonymous letter. Letter. <laughs> How are you going to answer an anonymous letter? Who are you going to send it to? <laughs> Me. <laughs> I'm going to send it to myself. Slump. I ain't in no slump. I just ain't hidden. <laughs> uh, how can you hit and think at the same time? I explained that one. Uh, the future ain't what it used to be. Yeah, I love that, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, it gets late early out here. so <laughs> That makes sense, though, because of daylight savings time. And it said uh, late in the season playing left field at Yankee Stadium, the shadows would make it tough to see. Oh, no shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said about it, one of his teams, we have deep depth. <laughs> we have deep depth. <laughs> and he would That's say. Like we have dead, dead. Yeah, yeah. Pair up in threes. <laughs> Pair up in three. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. I think that's my favorite. I can see a coach saying that, pair though. Because like, if, if you're pairing up, you're always pairing up with hey. two people. But if you want them to pair up, but you want it to be more than two yeah. people, it makes sense. What word do you use? Yeah, yeah exactly. Trips up in threes. There you go. Uh, you've got to be. Trips up in threes. <laughs> you got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. <laughs> Even Napoleon had his water gate. What the fuck? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> he hits from both sides of the plates. He's amphibious. Amphibious? <laughs> it was impossible to get a conversation going. Everybody was talking too much. <laughs> this one's fun. I, I just love the way his brain works. It's, <laughs> it says, I don't know if they were men or women fans running naked across the field. They had bags over their heads. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry did someone not take him to anatomy class <laughs> uh, so I didn't actually say this one this is usually one of the first ones that's credited as being the first yogiism uh, he was uh, because he was from St. Louis he was invited to uh, when he made the uh, Major League Baseball roster him and Joe Garagiola were actually honored one night uh, in a nice restaurant a nice little event and uh, he had to give a speech and he hated giving speeches 
Um, and he, he bumbled his up. He said, I'm a lucky guy and I'm happy to be with the Yankees. And I want to thank everyone for making this night necessary. <laughs> uh, I got a little bit, a couple more. Uh, I'm not going to buy my kids an encyclopedia. I'm not going to buy my kids an encyclopedia. Let them walk to school like I did. <laughs> This is another logic one. I never blame myself when I'm not hitting. I just blame the bat. And if it keeps it up, I change bats. <laughs> After all, if I know it isn't my fault that I'm not hitting, how can I get mad at myself? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I need to start doing that. Let's change bats. It's the shoes. I'll just change the shoes. Uh, if you can't imitate him, don't copy him. He apparently gave this advice to a young player who's trying to emulate the swing of future Hall of Famer Ro- Frank Robinson. Uh, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. <laughs> Um, here, the last two, uh, a lot of guys go, Hey, yo, say a yogiism. And I tell them, I don't know any, they want me to make one up. I don't make them up. I don't even know what, I, when I say it, they're, <laughs> they're the truth and it is the truth. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and this last one, uh, in, in that, uh, Marty Appel podcast, he, he said, uh, he thinks he has the lot. He, he thinks he heard the last yogiism, uh, late in his life. He went to visit him while he was in the assisted living facility. And, uh, um, as he was leaving, he asked one of the nurses, he said, hey, what time is 3.30 mass? <laughs> <laughs> and what he was really saying is, do I really have to be there at 3.30? What time does it really start? <laughs> <laughs> what time is 3.30 mass? It's like, quick, quick, give me the number for 911. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh, but that would so be me. <laughs> Well, that was an awesome story, man. I, I really appreciate you putting that together. I appreciate that. Yeah, oh, yeah. So uh, I think we got a bath three coming up next, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yep, the research is all done. I just got to put it all together. Sweet. Well, thanks for listening, guys. Yeah. And remember, you can find us by searching nerdybones.podbean.com and looking under three in history. We are on Podcast Addict, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, Pandora, Stitcher, and anywhere else you can listen to your podcast. And again, also like us on Facebook at 3 in History Podcast and leave us a review as we greatly appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank also, you. what yeah. else can they do that we would like them oh, to do? Oh, we always love uh, corrections, suggestions, uh, and God, if we're lucky, give us a rating. Yeah, that, please that, do. Uh, the ratings help a lot because every time we get them, like, it, like I notice every time we get like somebody even giving us like a one star like shit bumps up so that helps. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, thanks a lot. We will see you next time. Bye, guys. Bye. Casey's the guy with his eye on the ball, but mostly the lady. Casey's the guy who's the idol of all, but mostly the lady. Casey is mighty and manly. He's a dangerous gent. Ye gad, when he goes to bat, hang on to your hat. He's batting a thousand percent with the lady. So Casey has nerve and he knows every curve.